everybody. I'm Ellen Ramsey from the University of Virginia. Um, and I am fully aware that I am standing between you and the reception. Um, so we will start on time. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm the director for scholarly repository services at UVA. Um, you can ask Chip what that means. We made it up. <laughs> um, and we thought it would be interesting, and apparently CNI agreed, to talk a little bit about what it's like to live with an open source implementation. Um, we've had one at UVA for a really long time, longer than I've been there. And so some of the things that I'll tell you today um, are uh, outside of my personal experience, but I'm sure they're all absolutely true. I want to give you a little bit of background, a little history. Um, about um, the platform and the, and the things that we're working with and sort of some things that happened um, before um, those of us who work on the project now um, have been working on it. Um, I'm sure that you've heard the history of Fedora and um, that it was born in Cornell um, in, the, in 97. Um, and 2001 is sort of when UVA started to get involved with this project in a really um, uh, significant way. We, um, we had what we call an alpha test bed at, at UVA, and it was definitely a proof of concept, um, something like a half a million images um, in a Fedora repository. Some things happened over time. We got some grant money. Um, there were some public rollouts. And by 2007, fast forward, um, we're starting to see some community movement. And so we've got Fedora Commons, um, and at UVA, we did a little thing called Blacklight. Um, and and uh, it was really interesting for me to go back and, and read the history on this. Um, I don't think I was even a librarian yet at that point. No, I'm kidding. Um, that there was a you know, general dissatisfaction with what the vendors were bringing and we wanted to build something that was better. Gosh, I think I've heard that before. So 2008, hey. Institutional repositories, they're awesome. We should have one. Um, so like all good research institutions, we wrote a report. Um, and there are options at that time where you're not too dissimilar to what institutions right now are looking at in terms of we could adopt one, we could extend something that we already had, or we could go make something brand new. But there was something else going on at that time, really, for the first time, which was there, was a lot of, there were a lot of things going on in the open source community. And so the rest of the presentation I want to show you is what was going on at UVA, but what was also going on in the open source community at that time. Uh, you might notice, though, my little icon there. Given that it is the holiday season, um, and given that this is a, a conversation about community source and what it means at the local level, um, uh, I'll just say that every time a bell rings, a developer gets their wings, <laughs> right? So I'll ring one bell, <laughs> um, which is one of the original founders of the Fedora project um, at UVA, um, Leslie Johnston, left UVA to do much grander things elsewhere. Mm -hmm. 2009, hey, open access is good. Maybe we can use that to do some stuff. Um, so there were things going on uh, at the community level. Um, we got our faculty senate to start discussing an open access policy. <laughs> and Beth Sadler left UVA um, to go, again, do really interesting things in the open source community at another institution. So there was also some community movement. Um, we've got uh, Duraspace coming together at this point. Um, and so really a lot of things, a lot more resources um, that might be available <coughs> to us. Fast forward to 2010. Um, we finally get our open access resolution at UVA and it provides the rationale for our um, continued development of our institutional repository. Um, there's a link there, you can go read it. Um, Judge for yourself whether you think it might be effective or not. <laughs> um, we did get some resources, though, from the university based on that resolution um, to hire Media Shelf, um, to, uh, which is now DCE, um, to help us build um, what we call Libra, 
EVA has Libra, Virgo, Leo, you get the idea. The next one is Cancer, so we're not building that. <laughs> um, so, um, but we did, we did do that work. Um, oh, wait. Um, and so other institutions were, were building their own Hydra heads as well. And for the first time, we really see um, a community sourced project to look at a particular implementation of uh, a Hydra head, a Hydra implementation built on top of Fedora, which was called Hydrangea. It didn't really answer anybody's problems, but it was a nice start. 2011, hold on. Um, we had, fortunately, it was a good point in time that we had already begun taking deposits into the institutional repository head that we had built, um, but we did have a wholesale departure of our development team at that time. <laughs> so, um, things that were going on in the community, um, there was a lot of discussion about theses and dissertations being the low-hanging fruit, which I can't remember where the article, I wish I had looked it up. Um, somebody said, that's a horrible term. I agree. Um, but we were taking that kind of scholarship. We were taking what I call small data, right? What, what do you get? You have 100 megabyte data sets. That's not even a data set, right? Um, and we had uh, availability for open scholarship in this tool. Moving into stuff I can actually remember now. At this point, between 2012 and 2014, I want you to notice no developers left. <laughs> um, and we got some stuff done, right? So, um, and you start to see our repository down here, this is what this is, is really growing, okay? So we're up around 3,000 items, something like that. Most of that, I would say, are theses and dissertations, um, for sure. So um, we've got that going, and we've got you know, great linkages there. Um, not too much interest in the other things that the repository can take. Um, and oh, all of a sudden, man, that code base is um, getting old, right? So things that had been going on in the, in the community is that Fedora had been you know, coming out with new public releases. We had one, we had two, we had three. We're now getting to four. Um, our Fedora instance at this point was at two. Um, so that's where we were. That we were inter interacting with the community, but um, had some challenges to overcome. And oh, there's another <coughs> community sourced institutional repository collaborative project. This one was called Hydromeda. Yes, there's some laughs in the back of the room. Wait, you want to know who was in that team? It, it'll be a good uh, list. So it was five institutions. Uh, Notre Dame, Northwestern, Indiana, University of Cincinnati, and the University of Virginia. So there's some really familiar names to those of you who um, are still members of the now Sam Vera community, right? So lots of things did happen. They did not happen through Hydromeda. Twenty fifteen. Um, yeah, that code base seriously old. But, oh, I don't know how to do a half a bell. <laughs> we only had one developer leave, and we got two more. So I think that's a half. Um, so we stopped our, our participation in Hydromeda at this point, and, but we were really clear that, man, we got to get off this old thing, right? Um, the usability for the students with the theses and dissertations was dropping, and they had to use it anyway, so we had a captive audience, but that wasn't very nice of us. Um, nobody was using data or open, hardly at all, because it wasn't a pleasant experience, and all of those other reasons that institutional repositories also maybe haven't been the answer to some of the things that we thought they would be. But in the community, um, we're getting some convergence on a couple of more successful um, uh, institutions institutional repository and uh, solutions. So Scholarsphere, Notre Dame's ND Curate, which ND Curate was actually what came out of Hydromeda, mostly. Um, and we're seeing more convergence on Fedora. <coughs> and 
we finally had the opportunity to go to door four. And what we took was a modular approach to what we needed to do with our repository. And a couple of things that we did a little bit differently. So we moved our uh, ETD implementation onto Sophia, which is what Scholarsphere became, and that was where the community was converging. Um, we did something really radical, and uh, our library IT director is still mad at me about this, um, which is we said we're not really sure that small data is that useful, and um, so we're not going to build anything for that right now. But there's this awesome thing called Dataverse um, that we're going to use for a while, thus the modular, um, and um, that has been a reasonable solution for us for the last couple of years that we've had it. And the other thing that we did um, is we took away the discovery layer from the institutional repository itself. If you want to know what's in our institutional <coughs> repository, that's awesome. You want to know what's in the library. And so it's in the library catalog. It's in Google Scholar. It has DOIs. It is in data site. So go find it there. Right? We don't want to silo this content um, because if the objective is, is to make open scholarship in context with all the other kinds of scholarship that libraries provide, that's great. Let's put it in the same place. And we had it there, but by forcing people to, essentially by forcing people to um, look for it in the library catalog, that really makes it clear that this is really in the library and it's valid stuff, valuable stuff. So we're watching the community. Um, as I said, Scholarsphere became Sophia, and you curate became curation concerns. Um, and while we were launching Dataverse, we're also watching what Michigan is doing with Deep Blue Data. We're still watching. <coughs> Um, and they've got wonderful stuff, and, and um, you know, that may be the direction that we go. But there's some other stuff that's happening in the broader community. Elsevier starts buying stuff, <laughs> like SSRN. And we're seeing some more Mellon investment um, that we think is really relevant to us. So Hydra in a Box, and I'm sure that you um, have heard of um, the presentations that have been around the, the conference about that. Um, and there's some really interesting things that Mellon is funding in terms of what might we do with open monographs. And initially that research was about sort of how much does it cost, but then that has um, in the last year or two moved into, okay, now that we know what it might cost, how do we do that in, an, in a community way? So here we are in 2017. We finished um, building the modules to our institutional repository this year. We launched the um, faculty piece, the open scholarship piece of Libra in, um, in August of this year, Libra Open. Um, it's got some stuff that we didn't have before. We're actually pushing people's uh, deposits to ORCID, um, and that's pretty neat. We didn't give DOIs before for open content, but we did for ETD, so we added that. Um, and the other thing I didn't put on the slide, but we just had it on Friday, was we turned off the original Libra instance. Um, we had a wake. It was fun. <laughs> so other things that are happening in the community, um, we've now got Hyrax instead of two separate instances of Sophia and, and Curate. Um, people are looking at Haiku. Haiku. Um, and we're seeing some interesting things going on with open publishing. More on the journal. Um, uh, sorry, on the open monograph side than on the journal side in the community. Um, and so that's, that's um, what we're watching. So what's next? We are um, really proud to announce that, um, can I announce this, Dave? He's looking at me. <laughs> um, that we, were pil we are piloting um, Ubiquity Press um, as an, an open journal. Um, service, and again, it's very similar to um, our decision about Dataverse in that we're really not sure how well this is going to take off. It might be fantastic. Dave thinks it's going to be. Um, and um, if it is, that's great, and we may invest resources later into building something more custom, um, or we may say, hey, this is awesome. Uh, and um, it is an overlay of an open system built on OJS, but um, it is also a, it's a, it's a, a, a vendor, 
right? So you know, we have made these decisions about what we can do to be modular, to be um, agile, to be responsive, um, without making enormous investments in. <laughs> so um, we will be migrating to Hyrex this year, um, given no ringing of the bells. And um, other things that have been happening in the community, I think you've heard about those a lot um, during this conference as well. Um, Hydra is not a thing, but Samvera is. Um, and I don't know if I've heard this today, but that Haiku and Hyrax, the code bases are actually going to move, <coughs> and so there should be some more alignment. Um, and that will be really interesting for institutions that end up going with sort of the more out of the box or in box solution of Haiku and want to do more customization with Hyrax. I don't know that I would go the other way, um, but you never know. Um, and so we're watching, now we're, we have the great advantage of watching our partners already migrate to, to Hyrax and they said, no sweat. So, and our repository has continued to grow. So some of the culture shifts that have happened during this time. Uh, as we talked about moving from an all-in-one repository, Libra One was just everything in one bucket, um, to some more replaceable components, moving to that single search so that we can have lots of um, sort of invisible sources for the content coming to what feels like the same place um, to users. Uh, internally, we moved from a more traditional, a little bit um, larger investment of time of an epic and story model of development to a more agile model. Um, and I had to learn how to do that. And um, I think that it has been very successful for us. Um, it's also something that the community was doing, and so we've been able to align better um, with, the, um, with the open source community. I think we have to recognize that as a partner, we're really, as, I, as, as it says, just altruistic enough to participate with the community, but make sure that we've got our eye on what's useful to us. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure um, in the Sanvera community, not a pressure, but there's encouragement to contribute to the community code base. Um, and we've done that, um, we are doing that, and we're doing it in most cases where we see a real outcome for what our repository needs as well, what our institution needs. And that's, that's a little bit more pragmatic, I think, than some institutions have been in the past, and that some institutions are now. Um, but, you know, just saying. Um, there's some things that have happened in the community that have been really helpful and move a little bit away from purely, uh, from just a technical community to really how to manage these projects, how to transition to, okay, we built it, and we still have to keep the thing going so that we don't have happen again, you know, an orphaned code base um, and uh, you know, aging software. Um, and, and it really has been sort of um, what I would term agile production. We, we are still doing sprints for our um, Libra implementation, but we only do them once a month now. And we sort of you know, gather up a little bit of stuff um, and, and roll it out. And one of the benefits of that has been that we had um, our, our ETD deposit period is always like right after Thanksgiving, so we draw straws, who has to cover over Thanksgiving. We had no questions this year over Thanksgiving. Um, and so, you know, we really have been able to respond to our community while still keeping current with standards. And, and I think I made the last point already, you know, that there's a recognition of um, things that you can get from the community, but it also that it costs, and it's not always the solution in every case. Um, you, either right out of the box, uh, or you know, maybe something that we go to longer term when we feel that we need a more custom implementation. Uh, for your reading pleasure, and the UVA team is so sick of this graphic, um, but it gives you an idea of where, you know, where we started and where, we, where we're trying to head, right? So the gray areas are what we are um, thinking about, um, and the white areas are what we have already rolled out. I would be delighted to take your questions at the reception. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody.